I'm Becca, and this is my husband, Gabe. That's me. Welcome to the podcast celebrating Jack Russell Terrier dogs. And all the joys of companionship with canines of every kind. Each episode, we'll explore all the heartfelt, humbling, and hilarious stories that only dog parents can truly relate to. We're Jack Russell Parents. Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. What's up? We've got some awesome segments for you today, including our special guest author and fellow podcaster, Liz Ledin, who is here to talk to you about her incredible picture book, Walking Your Human. She is coming to you from Sydney, Australia. You are all going to just love her. Until then, Gabe, what's up first? First up, we have dog parenting advice. We're going to provide you with some dog walking tips, but for this, we had to look to the experts because yikes. We sure did, uh, because we do not do well in this area, and Carson tends to walk us. He he takes off like he's in the, the front float in a parade. He, it's almost like he's showing us where to go. This way, guys. Hey, have you seen this before? You know, he's always in the front. But hopefully, we can begin to apply some of these training tips we're talking about today, and we'll see a difference. So we found some very helpful and I believe effective dog walking tips. And one of the things in my research that I found was that really the best dog walking tips are based on positive methods. They're never going to tell you to pull on a leash or choke them or any sort of negative thing. So the best way is to teach your dog to walk nicely on a leash is with rewards. Today's dog parenting advice comes to you from a blog called Dog Training Excellence. Dog walking tip number one, ask your dog to sit before you attach the leash to his collar. Number one, we're already in trouble. (laughs) We take out the leash and he's so excited to go on a walk to get out of the house that we have trouble even cornering him to get the leash onto him. He really wants to go outside, but he really has to know that for sure we're going to take him on the walk. He's not going to let us put a leash on him to give him a bath or something. It has to be a walk. Right. So I've been working on this the last uh, several days. I've been trying to get him before I take him out to have him sit. Mostly at least sit before I open the front door. And that seems to start him off a little calmer. Although as soon as I open the door, he dashes out like a maniac. So, okay. Dog walking tip two, bring dog treats for the walk and only use them for very good behaviors. I think this has been part of my problem recently with him is I'm trying to apply all these new things that I'm learning, but there's no reward for him. And so if I ask him to do something on the walk, like sit, he just looks at me like, what for? (laughs) (laughs) He's very quid pro quo. (laughs) He's like, what are you going to give me for? (laughs) So I I need to remember next time to pack some treats. Tip number three, never pull on the leash yourself. I I feel like sometimes if your dog is not quite there yet or not quite trained yet, you might have to a little bit because you you want to keep them out of the street or keep, you know, keep them from danger. But I mean, just don't use it as a method to jerk them around. We mostly walk through our neighborhood and Carson ignores most cars. It's, It's the trash truck or large construction vehicles. Those are the ones he chases. And I really feel like if we didn't pull him back out of the street, he would just run right in front of those giant tires. And it's really scary. He wouldn't. Now, I don't know how to fix that. (laughs) I don't know how to get him to stop wanting to attack garbage trucks. (laughs) He picks the largest vehicles (laughs) possible, like a bus, anything that's huge. Normal cars, he he couldn't care less. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting fact that I learned that, you know, why do dogs keep pulling on the leash even though they're like choking, right? Oftentimes if a dog's so eager, they'll they'll pull so hard that they're like choking themselves. And I read that it's because they have what's called an apposition reflex. This basically means that they have a reflex to oppose any force against them. I did not know that. 
I mean, that's absolutely crazy. So, so if our response is to yank and pull, we're just going to get yanking and pulling back in the other direction. So that's not going to be the best solution. Tip number four, you can use a head halter or chest clip harness instead of a regular collar. Uh, this person says never use a choke chain, slip collar, or pinch collar on your dog. They can harm them, obviously. And I also feel like that's more of that negative reinforcement. And, and again, with a Jack Russell, that is definitely not likely to yeah, work. We've tried kind of those really cushy body, hug your dog while they're out on a walk things. And I feel like the added comfort, Carson took that as a sign to pull even harder. <laughs> and so we have even more trouble controlling him when he's not wearing just a traditional collar. I don't know. But then again, that was a long time ago. Uh, maybe he's matured enough to where these could help. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm wanting to, to try to go back to some sort of harness. Uh, the, the front clip harness, um, that did not work well for him. He just walked sideways. So it like didn't pinch him as much. It didn't it quite. It wasn't quite as effective. He's too smart. <laughs> Uh, but maybe we'll try another harness in the future. Now's a good time for a commercial break. We will be right back. Tip number five. If your pooch is pulling on the leash, stop. Just stand there and wait for him to figure out that to keep on walking or to keep on going on your hike, that they have to let up on the leash. They have to let some slack be there. And I think the key to this is doing it consistently. So, the, you know, if you if you stop once and they and they finally get the idea, but then the next time they pull, you don't stop, then there's not that consistent, repetitive behavior you know you're not creating a habit in them so they're not they're going to be like oh well one time she's she made me stop the other time she didn't so i'm just going to do what i want <laughs> that's that's carson for sure keep it consistent yeah number six is pay attention to your dog and the surroundings if you notice another dog or a kid or a person coming your way you depending upon your dog and whether they're overly excited or maybe they're a little defensive on a leash things like that, you know, just be careful, have them sit until the person passes or veer in another direction and go away from the people. I find that that's something that I have to do a lot is just turn around. <laughs> if I, <have> to. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of friendly people in our neighborhood and they love dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, Texas is a very dog friendly state. And Carson has some people in the neighborhood that he just absolutely adores. And so it's really hard to like keep that consistent training method that we've been trying to employ uh, going because uh, he kind of loses his mind when he sees a friend. Yes, he does. <laughs> he loves he loves people. Tip number seven, ask your dog to respond to basic commands along the way to keep him focused on you. So have him sit uh, or spin or do another trick that he knows. And I've been trying this lately. And I think, again, like I mentioned before, the part of the problem is I don't have treats. But I've been having him sit. So just there's this long stretch of sidewalk and about halfway down or so I have him sit. And I'm trying to use what we learned from episode two about the psychology of a dog's name. So I use his name first and then I say the command, Carson, sit. Well, I have to say that command multiple times before he actually sits. But then I realize that once he does, he there's a lot more slack in the leash once he listens to me one time on the walk. Now, the other tip, tip number eight, is ask your dog to sit every time you stop at a crossing point or every, or every time you stop. So I thought, well, let me try that. So if we have a roundabout so there's a lot of crossing points. And so <laughs> when we got to the first one, I told him to sit. It, again, it took multiple times, but he finally did. And I didn't have any food reward, but I gave him a lot of praise. So he was like, okay. Well, then I crossed just this little bit of street and it's time to sit again. And he looked up at me like, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that this calendar year. So maybe we'll try something else. <laughs> And so I 
And I've done this multiple times on the walks. And again, no treats. So I'm going to bring those next time. But there's points where I'm standing at the cross of the street and I'm like, we're not crossing, buddy, until you sit. And he just, he'll stand there. He'll, he won't make eye contact with me. I say, look at me. He won't look at me. And he just looks up and down the street. He smells the air. A complete defiance. He will yeah. not sit. I remember you called me and you were like, he's ignoring me. <laughs> he won't even look at me. He's not crossing the street, but I... He's ignoring me. Oh, my gosh. He's so funny. He's such a little stinker. Anyway, so we're making progress. But we will continue to work. And I will bring him a reward. Uh, Tip number nine, ask your dog to sit before you let anyone pet him. This is especially hard because he loves people. And so uh, our one neighbor, John, he loves this guy. They moved in a few months back, and and John loves him back equally, right? He comes out the front door the other day just like, Carson's they, here. They see us coming down the street. He comes out of the house. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so they love Carson, and they have a Jack Russell of their own as well, Barkley. Uh, but Carson will, like, bellow at him, that friendly bellowing bark, and just get right up close to him, like, pet me and... Anyway, so I love their I love how much they love each other, but I, I don't know how I'm gonna get him to sit <laughs> before that. Good luck, Des. Uh, and the last tip is don't accidentally reward your dog for behaviors you don't like. Obviously, it seems obvious, but I think sometimes for us, even when a pet really wants a treat or you know, you kind of you can kind of give in. <laughs> You can give in a little bit and just be like, well, that was close enough. But it's not right, right? Because then they're going to create those bad habits. When we started reading all the the Jack Russell group posts, I, I thought we were alone in the fact that Jack Russell's love to steal things. He had this massive kleptomania issue going on. <laughs> and, and the only way we could get him out from under the bed or under a couch with something he wasn't supposed to have was give him a treat. And a lot of times it worked. And then we were like, did we train him to steal with, you know, giving him that reward for negative behavior? But no, I think that's just something that they do. So we just ignore it. And he actually stopped destroying what he steals. Eventually yes. he comes out with it and just lays it at our feet. Mm -hmm. Like he wants to play with it. Now with so many tips to think about, let's take a break. We will be right back to hear from the super talented Liz Ledin. <laughs> Aloha Mama Apparel wants to spread the spirit of Aloha. Genesis Belot, the creator of Aloha Mama Apparel, was born on the mainland and resides in Southern California. But she cherishes her Hawaiian culture and honors the half of her family that lives on the island. She loves being a mama and a designer. At Aloha Mama, they know being a mama is hard work, but it's the best work. That's why they style mamas and kiddos in apparel that is bright and filled with beachy vibes. For the cutest casual attire celebrating the spirit of Aloha, go to shopalohamama.com. That's shop, A-L-O-H-A-M-A-M-A.com. Shopalohamama.com. We are here with fellow children's book author and podcaster, Liz Ledin. Hi, Liz. Hello. How are you? Thank you for joining us all the way from Australia today. We have a, a slew of questions to ask you, so we might as well just jump right in if you don't mind. Fantastic. Okay. So the first one is kind of a fun, more um, icebreaking type question just to get you in, to know you a little bit. So what kind of dog most resembles your personality? Uh, I think it could be a whippet, um, which I think are really, really cute. But I think it's just because they're so kind of, they're fun and they're energetic and they're sort of, you know, 
leaping around the place, but they also have this other side to them where they're really um, affectionate and they actually like being at home with their family a lot. So I think, yeah, it's a bit like me too. I do have those kind of two different sides. That's so neat. I, I love that particular type of dog. My parents had one of those for many years and she was super sweet. So cool, cool choice. Uh, next, why don't we jump in and you can tell us about your newly released children's picture book, Walking Your Human. Walking Your Human is a picture book basically written from a dog's point of view, and it's about all the best things to do on a walk with your human. So these dogs think they've got humans all figured out about what people really like to do. Um, so they think if they see the human lazing around, for example, relaxing, they think that means the human's basically just waiting for the dog to take them out for a walk. And then once they're on their way, the dog has all kinds of ideas on what to do, like if they think the human needs cooling down. They'll drag them into a pond, for example, thinking the human's <laughs> just going to love it. Um, and they think they're going to please the human by stopping to take in a beautiful view, which is actually the butcher shop window to check out. <laughs> me. So it's basically the dogs thinking they know exactly how to please their human and thinking they're very clever. And the poor old frazzled humans are just being dragged along for the ride. But then at the end of the day, it's also, I guess, about the human and dog bond, because even though the human's been through all of that on the walk, at the the end of the day there's actually a quite um loving scene where they're lying in bed together and I don't think the human's actually that mad after all that the dog has put them through all of that <laughs> <laughs> we say that often is like sometimes I'm like Rebecca can we just go for a walk and hold hands because if Carson is with us it's it's a whole other type of journey <laughs> I actually do that too. There's occasionally times where I go for a walk and I kind of like, oh, I want a different kind of walk to a dog walk. Like I actually want to do some exercise and walk fast. So sometimes I have to leave the dog behind. <laughs> I'm a bit guilty, but you have to do it sometimes, right? You do. You do because they they are on a mission and they do feel like they're walking you. And, and, and I, I just love that. So what was the inspiration behind this story idea? Basically, at first, I was playing around with a picture book idea about a little child taking their grandpa on a walk and kind of doing similar things where they're making the grandpa do all these things. But it just wasn't quite working or maybe wasn't too funny. And then um, around that same time, we actually adopted a dog like from a, um, an animal rescue center. And this dog we basically got to trial walking her um, at the Animal Rescue Centre just to kind of see how you get along. Like you kind of take a few different dogs for walks basically to see if you bond or whatever. And the dog we ended up getting was actually the one who – wasn't very good at walking on a leash like she kind of pulled us along and she kind of did this weird thing where she leaned sideways like she couldn't even stand upright but even though she put us through all of that she was kind of the most loving and affectionate dog and that's actually the one we chose not the ones that like were really quite well behaved and well trained so that actually inspired the story in that like I just thought dogs they can be a bit delusional or they think they're doing the right thing but they don't really know and at the end of the day it's really just about you know companionship and love. And rumor has it that that dog is part terrier, you think? Yes, that's exactly right. It is. <laughs> you know a lot about dogs. <laughs> that's awesome. So you kind of answered this question already, but I'll see if you, you want to add anything to it. Why did you decide to write this story from the perspective of a dog? And so you kind of just explained that, but I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I think it's just because if the same story um, with the same sort of going for a walk scenarios was written from the point of view of a human, it wouldn't quite be as funny. It, the human would see the walk as potentially even a little bit negative because of all the things <laughs> that happened along the way. But with the dog telling it, you kind of realise that they, they are a bit delusional, a bit sassy and a bit crazy. And um, I think it just adds like an extra layer of humour by, by sort of getting inside a dog's head, I suppose. Yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. So have you always been a dog lover? And sub question, when did you get your first dog? Yeah, I have always really liked dogs. Um, I got my first dog when I was about seven years old. We got a little um, silky terrier mixed with a poodle. And um, I got to name her. I called her Millie. And it was actually named after Enid Blyton's um, books about Amelia Jane, which was like a naughty schoolgirl. Um, yeah. So Millie short for Amelia. And um, the dog kind of ended up living up to the name. She was quite naughty. But yeah. again, it's that thing where you kind of put up with it because you love them so much anyway. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a mission. 
<laughs> we love we absolutely love our naughty dog too um so this is kind of a, a silly question but if you were a dog what might be your favorite thing to do I think the first thing that comes to mind is delicious food. I think I'd probably be pretty envious of um, my humans' amazing meals. And I don't think I'd just want to put up with having the same old like dog food every night for dinner. So I'd probably, yeah, be trying to share uh, some of the humans' yummy meals, I think. You got to break off a little percentage of every meal. Every meal. (laughs) Carson's scratching at the door. Time for a short commercial break. Welcome back, folks. We are here with fellow children's book author and podcaster, Liz Ledin. The illustrations in this book are absolutely adorable and and so fun. Uh, Tell us a little bit about, um, did you get to work with the illustrator? Did you have any say in that? How did that come about? So basically, the publishers of my book, um, Larrikin House, which is a picture book publisher in Australia, they found the illustrator. um, Her name is Gabriella Petrusso. She actually lives in the UK. And I think they found her through Instagram, which is where a lot of the publishers, I think, these days tend to find amazing illustrators. And Gabriella Petrusso is really, really good at um, animals and also really, really funny expressions. So it was kind of the perfect illustrator for this book. Um, And basically, I got to suggest a few ideas about some of the scenarios to the publisher because some of the words don't really explain what's happening. You kind of have to um, think of a whole scenario of what's actually going on. So I got to suggest a few of those which they passed along. And then the illustrator got to kind of bring her own creativity to the project. So she kind of um, she kind of took on board some of those suggestions um, that I made, but she also thought of heaps of scenarios herself. And she also came up with a whole lot of different dog breeds and humans that kind of match. A lot of them look alike as as yeah. dogs and their owners tend to do. And, um, yeah, so basically she went off and did that. And I got to see some roughs along the way. But basically she very much brought her own ideas and her own, yeah, creativity to the project. That's fantastic. I, I love that an illustrator can read your words and, and come up with um, ideas and visuals and things that you hadn't even thought of, right? Exactly. And it's also a really nice surprise, like as the writer, to see what they've come up with because some of it you're like I would have never thought of that because illustrators I guess they you know they think so visually and they think of completely different things to to non-illustrators. Yeah absolutely I wrote a, a story for Ladybug magazine is about a little girl and she was trying to draw this picture and she didn't know how to draw the hands and, and anyway so there was no animal in the story but then when the illustrator got a hold of it he put this little, I think it looked it looked to me like a little pug. And, and it became like her sidekick, you know? And I was like, that is perfect. That is a perfect addition to the story that I hadn't even thought of. Yeah, I love books that do that too, that kind of have um, like a little visual clue on each page. And then kids reading the picture book too, they can find this kind of extra little thing. It kind of adds this whole other layer to the story. So yeah, yeah, it's heaps of fun. Getting into the mind of a sassy dog, what is your best piece of dog parenting advice? Oh gosh, I think it's going to have to be um, tolerance because as you know, as we can see from this book and also from our real life dogs, your dog and my dog, they, they can be a bit mischievous and a bit of hard work sometimes, but I think you have to have a lot of give and take. And I think you have to sometimes just tolerate it because the rewards at the end of the day are kind of worth it. Absolutely. You just, they have so much love on the, at the same time, right? Yeah, exactly. So tell us, do you have any other books available? Um, I do. So Walking Your Human is my second picture book, and I have another one called Tulip and Brutus, and this one's actually about bugs. So it's about a ladybug called Tulip and a stink bug called Brutus, and they won't play together because they just think that they're so different. But basically, um, a disaster strikes the garden that they live in, and it brings them together, and they basically work out that they have more in common than they realized. So it's a story. It is about it's about bugs and their habitat, but it's actually really about um, differences and friendship and how you can always find common ground with people you think are different to you. That's so great. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> so love that. 
there's a common, th- well, I don't know if insects and dogs are along the same lines, but they're kind of like animals. So, you know, what can we look uh, forward to from you in the future? Any more books with animals in them? Or are you going along a different path? Well, it's funny because I am working on a few other books, but they have human characters. So perhaps I'll diversify and might have some with actual humans as the main character. So I'm working on picture books, but also I like writing, um, I don't know if you call them junior fiction in the US or chapter books, but basically like, you know, longer books with chapters for kids. So I'm working on that as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's exciting. Maybe your human characters will have like bug names like Cricket or a dog <laughs> name like Spot. I, I don't. They might. Or they'll just have really cool pets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> so is there anything else that you would like to share uh, with us? One thing I could share with you is that as well as writing books, I also co-host a podcast myself. So it's called One More Page and it's actually all about kids' books. Um, So it's a podcast where we interview authors, illustrators, um, and sometimes other book industry people like publishers or booksellers. It's mostly about Australian authors um, and the Australian kids' book industry, but people out there who are writers might actually find it really interesting because there's lots and lots of tips on on writing from lots of the authors that we interview. So um, if you want to check it out, it's onemorepagepodcast.com and we're on social media at onemorepageau. That's a great title. Thanks. <laughs> yes. Just one more page before we go to sleep. Pretty relatable, I think. <laughs> yeah. And I have listened to your podcast, Liz, and it is absolutely entertaining. And even though it's from um, the you know the Australian perspective, I mean, I've, I've learned some things myself. So um, you guys are doing a great job. So. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's exciting you guys have got this podcast going as well. Yes, we are so excited. This has been it's been a lot of fun. We always talk about our dog uh, to anyone who listens or doesn't want to listen. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, now you're going to have a whole lot of listeners from around the world hearing about your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's the plan. So share with everyone real quick where they can get your picture books. Okay, so Walking a Human and my other picture book too are available online. They're available in bookstores. Um, So Walking Your Human is in bookstores across Australia and also the UK, if there's any listeners out there from the UK. Um, So books, uh, bookshops there like Foils and Waterstones have it in stock. Um, As for the rest of the world, I think the best thing is probably just to order it online. Um, So Walking Your Human, you can order from larrikinhouse.com, which is the publishing company. If that's not an option, you can always check out Book Depository because it's just one of those general book websites where you can basically order stuff and it ships around the world. So you can just search for the book title there. Wonderful. So we can get our hands on this awesome book. Actually, we have one coming in the mail. Surprise. We do. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yes, it, I can't we're, we're, we're quite far away, but it's on, it's on the way. <laughs> Oh, yay. I hope it doesn't take like months and months like a lot of things um, (laughs) tend to at the moment. Um, Our next uh, quick round of questions is what we're going to call the Zoomies round. Because whenever your dog runs around the house with that burst of energy that you're not expecting. For no apparent reason. The Zoomies. So we are going to ask you just some quick questions and whatever answer pops in your mind first, you just let us know. Okay, great. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Ah, so put on the spot. I'll have to say classic, really rich chocolate. Are you a clean or messy person? Oh, my God. I'm probably veering a little bit more towards messy. (laughs) (laughs) What's your favorite holiday? Halloween. I love the decorations. I love all the spooky stuff. It's just so much fun. What motivates you to work hard? That is a good question. I think probably... um, Sometimes I think it's actually my kids, like wanting them to be proud of me. So wanting them to think I've achieved something. So I probably think maybe, yeah, my family. What was the last book you read? The last book I read was called Honeybee by Craig Sylvie. So that was actually an adult novel, but um, it was really, really gripping, really, really interesting um, about a teenage boy, basically, and identity and um It's a bit harrowing in parts, but really, really good. Are you an introvert or extrovert? 
I think I'm actually an introvert. I definitely like time to recharge by myself. Yes, me too. Now, I I read some things about donuts in Australia. They were popular for a while, then they went away. Now they're back. Are you a donut person? Yes, I love donuts. It's so good. (laughs) We also had a bit of a cronut phase for a while. I don't know if you have those in Texas. They're like a mix between a croissant and a donut. We have a never ending kolache phase, which is basically an enclosed hot dog because we can't just have a you know a, a roll or a donut here in Texas. It has to be stuffed with meat with and meat. cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the last question is coffee or tea? Oh, I love both, but coffee has to be the winner. Just absolutely love coffee. All righty. Yes. Awesome. Me too. Um, well, we are done zooming. <laughs> we are done zooming. Yes. This has been so much fun, Liz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's so exciting to be on um, a podcast in America as well. And a dog themed podcast is just perfect. So yeah, basically, thank you to you guys. And I just want to also wish you guys luck with your new podcast venture. Thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Becca and Gabe, the Jack Russell parents. Say bye, Carson. We'd love to connect with you online at jackrusselparents.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at JRT Podcasts. That's at JRT for Jack Russell Terrier Podcast. The Jack Russell Parents Podcast is produced by Earball Audio. Jack Russell Parents is brought to you in part by Super Chewer. From the makers of BarkBox, Super Chewer is a themed monthly delivery of toys and treats made especially for dogs who play harder and demand a challenge. Simply go to jackrusselparents.com and click the Super Chewer link to enjoy their great offers while also supporting our podcast. Mm-hmm.